Okay, so good morning everyone and welcome to this in-house recruitment volume hiring webinar. My name is Natasha Priya-Cannon. I am the Managing Director of In-House Recruitment, fastest growing community for in-house recruiters, HR professionals and TA like you guys in the UK. Um, just a little caveat before we get started. We are, um, we are experiencing some technical difficulties um, here today. So my internet has totally gone. So um, always helpful run, when running a webinar. So I'm hotspotting. So if I do come in and out, do just let me know. And um, you can just use the chat function if there are any issues. Um, Sophia from Deliveroo, she is also having some technical issues this time with her mouth. So she, um, she had to log off, but she should be joining us shortly as well. So please bear with us. Um, the joys of working from home, isn't it? So, um, but thank you very much for joining us for this webinar and a special welcome to our speakers today. As I mentioned, we have Sophia from Deliveroo. Um, she will be joining us any second now, providing um, tech allows it. Um, and we also have Z that you should be able to see on the screen as well, who is from Fountain. For those of you who don't know, um, Fountain are our event partner for this webinar. Um, we can't run these events without our event partners, so it's a very warm welcome to those. And for those of you who don't know who they are, they are a leading recruiting platform for the gig and hourly workers. Um, they are here and they are designed to solve challenges around high volume, high velocity, high turnover recruiting. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping bits and pieces. At any point throughout the webinar, you are able to ask your questions. We will be posing them to Z and Sophia at the end of the session. But at any point, if you do have a question, there should be a little Q&A box for you at the, um, at the bottom of your screen underneath the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation that you can see. So just pop it in there and we'll be deposing those to Z and Sophia at the end. We will also be running a couple of polls throughout, so we're just trying to keep you engaged, keep you, uh, keep you listening. Uh, hi, Sophia, hope, you're, um, hope your internet's okay. <laughs> or is it your mouse? It's working now. <laughs> uh, okay, it's perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and everyone, this is um, Sophia from Deliveroo. Um, as I mentioned, we will be running a couple of polls throughout. It should just pop up on your screen. They are both multiple answers, um, so just select all that apply for you, but we will be talking you through that as that comes through. But anything else, if you do have any issues or any questions, um, just let me know. There is a chat option that you can speak to me directly as the um, as inspire are presenting, but for everything else, just use the Q&A box. Uh, we are recording the session as well, so if you get that, um, a phone call or your kids start um, needing some breakfast or whatever else it might be, we are recording the session, we can share that with you after the event as well. So that's it from me, I'm going to hand you over to Z. if you've got anything else, just uh, give me a shout and I'll come back for the Q&A at the end. Over to you Z. Awesome, thanks for that intro Natasha and thanks to you guys all for attending as well. Um, so yeah, just as Natasha mentioned, uh, to kick things off, this webinar is brought to you by Fountain. Fountain is the high volume hiring platform empowering the world's leading brands to streamline and also scale their recruiting functions. I will talk a little bit more about the platform uh, later, but our mobile first platform keeps candidates engaged and reduces drop off through built in automated scheduling, text and email reminders. Uh, from us, candidates can apply anytime, anywhere in minutes, right directly from their phone. And Fountain also enables on-the-go hiring managers to move quality talent through the pipeline, reducing their overall time to fill. Uh, we provide local, regional, and company-level analytics to make data-driven decisions. And we've also built a simple drag-and-drop workflow that allows for uh, quick changes to accommodate fluctuations in hiring needs. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but for now, I'm going to just uh, allow Sophia to give us a quick intro into who she is, her role, and what she does at Deliveroo. Hi, everybody. So uh, my name is Sophia Fellows, and I am uh, the Global Operations Excellence Manager at Deliveroo. Um, so I work on the rider side of the business, um, and my team is responsible for ensuring the effectiveness and efficiency of our rider onboarding support and kit operations. Um, so I've been working at Deliveroo for almost a year now um, and 
prior to that, I was working doing a similar role within fintech. Um, and before that, I spent a few years uh, doing operational readiness in the Olympics and other major sports events. Awesome. Thanks, Sophia. Um, so Sophia will be uh, talking a little bit more about delivery later on, um, and I'll also be hosting a short Q&A with her as well, so she can tell us a bit more about what she's been doing in detail. Um, as for me, I'm Zi Wang. I'm the uh, EMEA market lead for Fountain. I joined the business in April last year, and since then I've just been looking at how Fountain grows our footprint in the UK as well as the rest of the uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa market. Uh, so for my section, firstly, what I'm going to go through is just a very quick general snapshot of what Fountain is and does. Um, but also I wanted to focus on how uh, specifically the coronavirus has been impacting, you know, real life recruitment teams in terms of how they're working during this new normal, some of which you might sympathize with, and also what it's like for applicants who are looking for jobs today. Um, I'll then move on to spend part of the discussion talking about some of the ways in which innovative on-demand companies like Deliveroo are using tech to help them hire 72% faster uh, and leave you with three practical steps you can take to learn from this industry. And then finally, I'll give a very quick short overview on our partnership with Deliveroo before Sophia talks about some of this in more detail. And as Natasha said, throughout the webinar, uh, you, you know, will be asking questions in the form of polls. The first one will be taking place very soon. We'd love to get your responses on those polling questions to understand your challenges, but also if you've got any other questions for the Q&A later, please don't be shy and feel free to add them into the Q&A box um, that you can see on your screen. Brilliant. So just to kick things off, um, you may already be familiar with us, but just in case you aren't familiar and um, in case you're not familiar, Fountain is an end to end hiring platform, which uh, places a high focus on volume recruitment and automating everything needed for uh, automation purposes. So essentially our mobile first platform is a tool for recruiters to automate the entire recruitment process from screening all the way through to onboarding and even post hire as well. Fountain has been working um, with companies since 2014, operating out of both our San Francisco HQ and London offices to help over 180 clients across the globe with saving time and manual work from their current operating um, processes. And within all of that, we process roughly around 2 million applicants per month, um, helping people to do that automatically. And we have clients across various different industries. But one thing that they all have in common is the need to process a very, very high number of applicants quickly and often with very lean recruitment teams. So whether it's traditional businesses that work with us like Royal Mail or John Lewis, or you know, really cutting edge tech companies like Deliveroo, a lot of our clients leverage our technology integrations and also our open API to automate specific parts of their hiring processes. We also know as a business that no two hiring processes are the same, which I'm guessing as recruiters you can relate to. Um, so we've created our platform to ultimately be very flexible and easily used to fit all types of processes and hiring tools. So that's a really quick summary of what our tech provides. Um, I'll speak more about our tech later on, but for now, I wanted to address some of the ways in which we've seen the coronavirus pandemic affect both recruiters and applicants through the trends that we've seen. So it's probably safe to say that coronavirus has affected pretty much every corner of our lives, um, personally. And you know, while we might all be expert sourdough bakers by now, and some of us might enjoy the prospect of not going back to an office for a while, clearly there's been a lot of challenges within that as well. Most businesses that we've spoken to and we've seen in the news have had to make some pretty big changes, um, a lot of them you know, pretty much overnight, to either just stay trading or to pivot their services to other areas um, to keep going as a business. For example, we've seen a lot of mobile charging stations in pubs and restaurants being converted to provide hand sanitizer, uh, Burberry and Barber turning to hand to their hand to making face masks and PPE, a lot of businesses have been innovating really quickly during this super challenging time. And one area of the industry which has clearly seen an impact from coronavirus as well is the jobs market. So what about the jobs market? From the Office of National Statistics, we've seen that unemployment levels have 
basically reversed since the start of this year. Uh, previously, we were seeing the lowest levels of unemployment since the 70s uh, in the UK, but that unemployment has now steadily risen to over 20% as a result, obviously, of businesses closing, redundancies and furloughs as well. So because of that, job seekers are actually applying to six times more jobs than they would have been three or four months ago, which is making it very difficult for some recruiters, um, some of which are you know, operating on, on lean recruitment teams, whether there's people out on furlough or just already a very stretched team. Um, another trend that we've seen as well is the impact of coronavirus on our mobile usage. So I don't know if it's the same for you, but um, Personally, I see myself picking up my mobile a lot more and that's backed up in the stats where screen time has increased by up to 30% globally as we all start using our phones for streaming, social media, but also working from home. From our side, we've always historically seen a high number of applicants coming in from mobiles and that number is between 80 and 85%, uh, which is part of the reason why we've built a mobile first application form. And we also encourage our clients to use features like SMS to communicate with their applicants natively where they're most engaged. Uh, finally, we've seen some industries like hospitality who are still trying to find their feet and only starting to reopen. Um, and recruiters in these areas and a few others are, are starting to focus more on keeping their workforce and new applicants engaged for future placements, um, obviously because there's quite a lot of uncertainty, rather than you know, pinpointing immediate hires that you need people, where you need people to stay. Uh, as a result of that, we've also seen recruitment teams focusing more on nurturing the applicants and also building talent pools um, so that they're ready for later in the year or possibly even early 2021. So just to recap, at a very high level, there's been some significant shifts in applicant behavior in the last few, few months due to changes in the economy. Uh, many businesses are still using legacy systems though, which doesn't necessarily address some of these changes. So what's it like for applicants? Let's just step in the shoes, into the shoes of an applicant for a second. Traditionally, a lot of them have re always relied on job boards to find the open roles and go through a process of applying to multiple jobs um, while you know, waiting for recruiters to get back to them. However, with the way that things are at the moment, the higher volume of applicants per recruiter, as well as the increased competition from other applicants for the same roles, means that it can take a, you know, quite a long time to get back to all of these applicants. Um, we're hearing that applicants could be waiting for anywhere between two days to two weeks to hear back about an application, even if it's not a successful one. So obviously that can lead to a bit of frustration on their part. Um, so some of them tend to keep looking for jobs rather than just waiting and holding out for one or two jobs, which they might have done previously. As well as that, traditional processes can also be frustrating for the applicants, especially if the forms aren't mobile optimized or um, processes don't have very clear next steps which if you think about it is quite aligned with what we're actually used to elsewhere in our lives. Um, so from you know, looking at one day Amazon Prime delivery to getting instant gratification on, on social networks, we live in a culture where there's quite uh, a expectancy for very, very instant feedback. So added to that, there are some logistical challenges as well. You know, we can't conduct face-to-face -face interviews anymore. Um, DBS and right to work checks are moving remotely as well. So there's quite a lot for recruiters to wrestle with at the moment, but applicants are also going through similar challenges. And finally, a lot of them are considering multiple roles, but they may also be changing careers altogether. So I think we all need to be cognizant of the fact that they could require some extra training in those new roles. And so with that, I'm gonna pause very quickly and uh, hand over to Natasha to activate the first polling question. Yeah, absolutely. Is this the biggest hiring challenges one or? That's right. Yeah, perfect. So you should now be able to see it popping up on your screen. Yeah, so we'd love to just understand a bit better about what's happening in your world as a recruiter and where you think the biggest hiring challenges are at the moment where you work.
it is multiple choice as well, so just select all that apply to you. I'll just give it 30 more seconds or so for everyone to... And Natasha, do we get these results at the end or are they, is it live through the Power of Technology? Yeah, it's live. So once I've ended the polling, um, I'll be able to share the results with you so everyone will be able to see uh, what everyone else has, uh, has said as well. So um, I'll do that now, in fact. So hopefully you can see the results. Um, see, can you see them? Absolutely. Yeah, so 45% of you mentioned applicant drop-offs as a, a huge challenge at the moment. Um, and the next biggest challenges are internal bottlenecks at 34% and then team efficiencies at 24%. So brilliant. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, really, really good to understand your challenges as recruiters. Great. So moving on, um, we wanted to kind of take a deep dive into the lessons we can learn from people who are hiring at high volume. So who are these high volume hiring specialists? So from our perspective, we took the perspective of uh, on-demand companies who have really popped up in the last few years to offer all sorts of services. Obviously, delivery providing us amazingly convenient and brilliant food delivery, but we also have people in the space who make sure our parcels are delivered on time and even video consultations with GPs when we can't get to them at the moment. And even things like scooters, which I believe are just about becoming legal in the UK. Um, so these companies historically have focused on using very lean principles as businesses and rather than hiring more staff, uh, use technology to solve some of the challenges that you guys have mentioned in the poll as well. Sophia will obviously touch on more of this from delivery's perspective, but in general, the majority of Fountain's on-demand clients are focused on building and nurturing a pipeline of talent and also using a very mobile first approach. Uh, both things which are super important during this time from an applicant's perspective. They are also in the unique position of, you know, sometimes recruiting candidates who end up being customers. So the applicant experience could be just as important as the user experience when they're using the apps. Um, but to take you through a few numbers, um, I wanted to show you how different recruiting is at these on-demand companies. So the first thing to note is the efficiency. Um, on-demand companies on average are handling 18 times more applicants per recruiter than their traditional counterparts. So as I mentioned before, you know, they've always focused on operating lean and this stat really just compounds that. A lot of this is done through leveraging tech and this stacks up with our stats as well. I mean, on average in Fountain, there's one active user for uh, 1,845 applicants. So it's very much uh, about getting the most from every single recruiter and processing that as, efficient, as efficiently as possible. It's not just the uh, applicant to recruiter ratio, which is different though. On demand companies are also hiring a lot faster. Uh, again, on average, this segment of companies across all industries completes, so it completes their hiring, um, hourly hiring in less than 11 days compared to pretty high averages um, across other industries. Also, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that many on-demand companies uh, find a competitive advantage versus their traditional competition in this space, who from the research we've done take an average of around 48 days to complete every hire. So just to recap again, on-demand companies are somehow finding ways to process over 1,800 applicants per recruiter and they're hiring at least 19 days faster than traditional businesses. So how are they actually doing this? That's probably the question you're asking. Um, and so I've broken down three steps that might help you understand uh, some of the, the ways that they're getting the success. The first one, and I agree the most important, is to communicate with your candidates directly through their mobiles. Um, as I said before, a lot of applicants are applying from their phones. And even before our screen time shut up from working from home, having a mobile first approach lets recruiters communicate directly with applicants when they're most engaged. Um, as well as seeing 80% of our applicants coming through on a mobile, 
We've also seen that if you remove the need for passwords through Fountain or through another platform, then that actually increases the conversion rate for the um, applicants by up to 30%. So 45% of you talked about applicant drop-off, and that's one thing we recommend from the beginning to implement to reduce that. Um, but why is mobile so much better? Um, you know, if you think about the experience, it should really be a mirror of what you do on your desktop. Well, one thing that we've seen is that mobile obviously allows for SMS to communicate directly with applicants. And with that, you're not waiting for recruiters to check in with you. You're not waiting for an email and refreshing that inbox. Um, the proof of the pudding of that is actually in the open rate of SMS messages, which is around 98% within the first three minutes versus 11% for emails. Um, and I probably think my open rate for emails is a lot lower than that personally. But SMS has also saved recruiters a lot of time as well. If you think about you know, all those emails that you send or phone calls you make to try and nudge people through the process, and now we think about replacing all of that with SMS templates, then the few minutes per candidate here and there very quickly add up to a lot of time um, throughout your working day or your week. One other trend that we've seen massively take off in 2020 is video interviews, obviously because of um, social distancing. So we're all pretty much accustomed to that by now. But Fountain's clients have actually been using video recordings to partially or fully replace the phone interview process um, since we released this feature a few years ago. Uh, they're not just a really engaging part of the application form, but also fantastic for recruiters for saving time while giving you a few tools to analyze, you know, how they speak to clients, what their fluency is in a certain language, and generally how they fit your company culture as well. As well as that, booking interviews automatically with scheduling tools can help you just connect and get in front of your applicants at the time when it's most crucial, which is in the first 24 hours after their application. Um, with many of the applicants converting from other careers or coming back to work after a while, it's also important to keep in touch with them after the initial process as well. So a number of our customers, including Deliveroo, have been using our integrations with learning management systems or micro learning partners to make sure that training doesn't stop during the lockdown period. Um, so we, yeah, I can talk a little bit about more uh, about integrations in detail if it's helpful, but um, one thing to note is that as well as learning partners, We've also integrated with a whole range of other providers, maybe some of these you're already using as part of your stack. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, we know there's no silver bullet for recruitment platforms. Um, as much as we'd like one platform for all recruitment needs, realistically, that probably just won't happen. Um, so from our side, we've seen an increasing need from companies to integrate with other technologies, which is why we've taken a lot of steps to partner with best in class partners in recruit marketing, background checks, um, at any part of the process as well. So our team is always evaluating partners and extending this list, but we also have an open API as well for anyone who wants to create their own custom integrations. And finally, one last thing uh, to note is that all on-demand clients uh, that we have always continue to test their own processes. Just like there's no super bullet for um, recruitment platforms, there's no one process that works across all industries, roles, or locations um, as well. And also with stuff like coronavirus happening, you know, we are forced to change and, and look at processes too. So Fountain allows you to prioritize your candidates by the variables that are important to your process um, and through automatic filtering and scoring. As well as that, as you can see on that video, we have a very simple drag and drop workflow editor which lets you set up new tests with just a few clicks. Um, added to that, we have A-B testing capabilities that allow you to split your, your candidate pool as well. And that helps in obviously randomizing the tests and removing some of the bias you might from doing it manually too. So before I pass on to Sophia, um, just to recap, uh, optimizing for candidate experience, identifying each part of the process in detail and also picking out the right tech vendors can really help uh, with you know, speeding up your recruitment and automating it all together. And finally, continuing to test and retest conversion flows. Um, with that, those three steps should all help you out during this new normal. 
So finally, my last slide before I pass on to Sophia, is just some very short bullet points and headlines on our partnership with Deliveroo so far. So Deliveroo, um, unless you've been living under a rock in the UK and, and in Europe, um, are obviously a fantastic company that have been providing uh, a great service to us all, myself personally included. Um, we're pleased that they they were one of Fountain's first clients here in the UK, going back about five years. And since then, we've been working with them to automate and streamline a lot of the hiring across the globe for riders, which includes integration with tech partners. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Sophia and I'll be back later for some Q&A. Cool, thanks so much, Steve. Um, and hopefully my internet connection is gonna withstand the duration of this webinar, so apologies if I do drop out at all. Um, so yeah, just a quick introduction about Deliveroo. Um, as many of you know, uh, we are a food delivery company, so we're a marketplace that connects customers, restaurants, and riders who deliver the food. Uh, Deliveroo was founded in 2013 by Will Shu. Uh, so he was a banker in London at the time, and he wasn't really seeing the, the offering that he wanted for great food to be delivered to his desk uh, when he was working all of those long hours. So he saw an opportunity on a scooter him. And delivering, uh, uh, delivering pizzas um, on his scooter in Chelsea in London. Um, we've got a mission to be the definitive food company and we've expanded to 12 countries, which you can see by my rather slapdash uh, place rue heads um, in that slide. So um, there's the UK, Ireland, Spain, Italy, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Kuwait, UAE, Hong Kong, Singapore and Australia that we're operating in at the moment. Um, so that's sort of the overview. And then before jumping into kind of some of the challenges and the way that we address those at Deliveroo, I wanted to give you a quick overview of um, what our onboarding process looks like in general. So obviously this varies slightly from market to market, but on the whole, we have the same sort of six stages um, across all of our, all of our countries. Um, so uh, an applicant will enter through the apply page and they'll, they'll enter their basic information. So we could try and keep that as sort of lean as possible. Um, when we're ready to move them through the funnel, we go into the doc check stage. So that's really for us to make sure that our providers meet all of the regulatory requirements that we have in each um, country. So for example, the right to work, potentially criminal background checks, insurance, um, if, they're a, if they're riding a, with a vehicle, then a driver's license, etc. We then move on to um, an online learning stage. So this is really fair with what it means to be a rider at Deliveroo. We talk about various functionalities of, of the app and the operations. Um, they'll be through that stage. Um, and sorry, that is an animation. And then we follow up with a quiz to kind of try and embed that learning. Once they're essentially them signing their contract to work with delivery. Um, and then finally, uh, they go through to a kit stage where um, they, they get a delivery kit. So we make sure they have the right kit to deliver and be on the road. Once that happened, they're approved and then they're ready to ride. Um, and you can see with along this sort of journey that they, that they follow, uh, we've got very integrated third parties that we work with um, who are sort of touch on. I just really, really sorry to, to interrupt. Your, um, the sound's just a little bit dodgy. Maybe um, you can switch your camera off. So I think we're, start, we're having a quick polling question again. Um, Natasha, are you going to tee that one up? Yeah, there you go. Um, so I was just saying it's, it's a little bit of a dodgy connection um, just with the audio. So maybe if you turn your camera off, it might help with the... Yeah, the let me do that. Do you want me to repeat that? Or... And I think most people got it, but Natasha? if anyone does have any... Can you hear me?
I think people, I, I think people would get most of it. If anyone's got any questions that they want to pose to um, Sophia or um, or Z, just pop them in yeah. and bring them to you at the end. And I think there's a bit of a lag. Sorry about that. No worries. Good old technology, eh? <laughs> So the poll is just running currently, so I'll give it another 20-30 um, to 30 seconds, I can see the numbers going up, and then I'll, um, I'll uh, share the results with you. So this one is obviously more around the current hiring software that you guys have. Okay, I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, hopefully you can see the results. Yeah, I can see those okay, Sasha. Perfect. Fantastic, really interesting mix. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like from this, a quarter of you have um, hiring software that allows you to communicate using SMS, which is um, really interesting. Um, but it is good to see that a lot of you have technology that allows applicants to apply directly from their mobiles, which is obviously a great uh, feature to have. Amazing. I'll stop sharing now for you guys. Cool. Um, sorry about the internet connection. I hope just shout if, again if, if, if it interrupts, um, but hopefully it would be better without the video now. Um, yeah, that audio is so much better, Sophia. So I'll, I'll go on mute now. Okay, Brill. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk through um, some of the challenges that we face with um, onboarding in high volume. So as you can imagine, operating across 12 uh, markets all of our markets of different regulatory requirements. So we try and standardize uh, across markets as much as possible, um, but we need to be a flex flexible to, enough to allow for these different requirements. Um, so the, I guess where that really introduces a challenge is that when you're onboarding um, a third party to work with, you have to really make sure that the, the third party can work with each of, each of the markets you're in and that they can uh, deal with all of the necessary processes for that market. Um, secondly, uh, really thinking about sort of the, when we're looking at the applicants, the different cultures, rider profiles and languages that we get in the, each of our markets. So it's really interesting working globally to see how different the makeup of our rider fleets are. So we have um, agency markets in UAE and Kuwait, so we actually get all of our fleet through agencies. So we have a whole set of different processes there. Um, thinking about uh, different languages. So in quite a few of our markets, we have a real mix of nationalities and a lot of our riders are actually non-nationals. Um, so again, when we're working with um, third parties, um, some of the softwares will adjust languages to the language setting on the phone to like help deal with this. Um, and then also there's real nuances in the makeup of our rider fleet uh, by market so that, and the type of uh, profile we attract depending on our rider proposition compared to our competitors. Um, so these are all just sort of things that we need to think about when we are setting up our onboarding funnels. Um, next is seasonality. So um, many of you might not realise but uh, delivery as a business is actually very seasonal, particularly in countries where um, the weather and uh, flexes a lot. So, for example, in Europe, um, we have much higher demand during the winter months where we've got bad weather and long dark days, whereas in the summer, obviously, people tend to go out more and eat, eat out a lot more. Um, so that also means that we have a big um, difference in need for supply at different times of the year. So in Q4, we have a massive increase in demand. Um, and this means we have to onboard literally thousands of riders per week. Um, 
So there's a challenge in the sheer volume of riders that we need to onboard at certain times of year. Um, but it also means that when we're looking at any sort of efficiency change transformation projects, these all need to be done before that time of year to do risk any um, impact on, on our ramp up period. Um, and then, yeah, changing environments due to COVID. So um, COVID has been really interesting for us. Uh, we have seen, I guess, as obviously restaurants haven't been able to do dine in um, for quite some time, there has been a spike in demand in a lot of our markets um, for, for delivery. Um, this has meant that we've had a sort of spike in our onboarding as well. So at a time of year where maybe we'd normally coming into the summer wouldn't be onboarding so many riders, we've been onboarding again thousands per week. Um, so that's been challenging, you know, I guess at a time where we haven't necessarily been, necessarily been prepared for that from a headcount perspective internally is trying to find efficiencies internally on how to onboard that many riders in such a short space of time. Um, and then also in three of our markets, we were actually um, operating face to face onboarding. So riders would book a, applicants would book a session with us and come in and we would do document checks face to face. So literally in a matter of weeks, um, we had to move to remote onboarding in those markets. So that was, that was interesting for us, but we, um, we pulled through in the end. Um, and then, yeah, basically so all of these sort of different things to take into account all the time while trying to increase our conversion and become more efficient and provide a great applicant experience. Um, so on to the next slide, how do we do it? So I just wanted to talk through, I guess, four main points um, of kind of the things that we focus on to help us um, deal with these challenges um, of high volume onboarding. So it sounds obvious, but automate as much as possible. Um, We've been doing a lot of work uh, around that area for the, like, the last six months. Um, doc checks were definitely um, our biggest efficiency drain internally. And we've now, uh, we're now working with um, Onfido, who some of you might know, to do automated document checking, which is a huge head, head count saving, but it also massively um, improves conversion and velocity through the funnel. Um, you know, when we were doing doc checks ourselves, even if it was remotely, um, you know, we don't have the capacity to be to be able to do that kind of thing within minutes. Whereas um, with Onfido, it literally is within you know minutes and sometimes even seconds that someone can be approved through that stage. So that's really great to see. Um, focus on applicant experience. So um, this is really important. Um, and I guess when you're really focused on the metric, sometimes I think in less school you you can easily forget about it. But it's a massive part of actually pushing um, those applicants through and also I guess you know in in all of our countries there's a big rider community so you want word of mouth is important and you want your applicants to have a good experience when they're on board with you so some of the things that we do around here is um, we try really hard to keep our funnels lean so when you're dealing with thousands of riders being on board at a time it's quite easy to do that you kind of just push them all through and it's a constant sort of pushing through of applicants um, but there are times of year, as I said, where we're not onboarding as much. Um, and it's important at those times not to let an applicant go through too far through the process if you're not actually going to onboard them at the end. So we try and kind of hold applicants at the top of our funnel um, and not make them go through, you know, all of the effort of dot checking um, unless we actually are ready to onboard them. Um, and it's definitely true that um, applicants will convert best if they aren't held for a long time. You know, if you can push them through quickly, they're more likely to go through and more likely to activate at the end of it. Um, and then I, another thing is just not giving applicants a reason to drop out of the funnel once they're in it. So I think Z touched on this, um, you know, not having to have passwords for all of the third parties that you're integrated with, any integrations that you have, um, it's really important that they're seamless and that to the applicant, it doesn't really feel like they're leaving um, the, the flow that they're in um, and yeah not having a sort of disjointed step where they need to go out and check their email to, to move on to another third party so keeping it as seamless as possible and then just really um, I think the next thing is really around simplification and communication so you know making the steps in your in your funnel or your process as clear as possible um, communicating clearly so that that's both from instructions and what they should be doing 
um, to remind us, um, using graphics and videos if there's anything complicated um, and just trying to tailor the communications to the situation. And again, as you said, um, using different channels where appropriate. So SMS, for example, we use um, predominantly like right at the end where we're, where we're trying to like really push them to act on signing their contracts and, and buying their kit. Um, so then the next point is in terms of uh, kind of how else we do it is standardizing, measuring and testing. So I've mentioned that our markets have different regulatory requirements and sometimes there are different commercial sort of requirements as well. But at base, very similar checks are done and a very similar process is there. So we've been doing a lot of work on standardizing this across our markets. Um, and what that means is also having a standardized process means that we also have standardized KPIs and we can actually compare KPIs um, across markets and have benchmarks and, and see how they're doing against one, one another. Um, it also means that when we have standard processes across our markets and we test things in one country, we can assume the results um, would be at least similar in, in others. Um, so when we are looking at making changes to comms, for example, or changes to our processes, we A-B test um, to see the improvement in our metrics before actually rolling out across all of our markets. And that's really key for us. And then finally, just remaining flexible. So yeah, I think COVID has shown everybody that businesses, if, you know, if businesses want to thrive, they have to be able to react and they have to be flexible. Um, so as I mentioned with COVID, moving from face-to-face -face onboarding to remote within weeks, um, you know, there are changes in policies and regulation um, and then being able to change these processes quickly and at scale as well. So um, yeah, Fountain is really a, a platform which enables us to do that do those things and react quickly um, so it's been really great for us and that's it from me um z did you have any or anybody did questions yeah amazing thank you so much Sophia. thank you um z did you have a few questions for um Sophia? Yeah, I have a few questions um, for Sophia related to, to delivery specifically, but I think maybe after I go through these questions, let's open it up to the rest of the room um, and see if there's anything that's unanswered. But Sophia, thanks firstly for taking us through those few slides. It was, for me, it was super helpful to understand a bit more about delivery. And I certainly enjoyed the point about um, Will Shu actually making pizza deliveries on his own at the beginning, which is quite an interesting insight into how far the company's come. Um, so yeah, I, I've got a few questions actually regarding some of the points you talked about. So the first one is obviously COVID has affected all of us in the way that we work. How has it been for you? And you know, how has delivery been set up to work throughout the lockdown period? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think probably like most companies when COVID happened and it became very clear that we were all going to have to work remotely. There was a sort of slight element of panic and, you know, are we going to be able to do this? Are we going to be able to work effectively um, remotely? Um, particularly in like functions like operations where, you know, it's pretty rapid and a lot of face to face conversations are happening every minute. Uh, but what, what, what we have found is actually being a sort of global tech company. Um, we were kind of set up for re working remotely anyway. So um, within the operations function at Deliveroo, we work in sprints. So that's every two weeks, basically we set out a plan of what we're going to achieve. Um, and we have daily standups um, to kind of track our progress on that. Um, and then obviously we've been working using, um, you know, Zoom or uh, Google Hangouts, um, anyway to, to kind of communicate with all of our markets. So all of those things have actually meant that, um, <laughs> although a strange transition, I think personally for people to be working in different environments um, in terms of sort of effectiveness of work and how we've been working, there hasn't been a huge impact, which is great. Fantastic. Yeah, and you, you guys obviously have a, a global ops team that crosses 10 time zones. So I think, you know, we're, we're all getting accustomed to Zoom, but stuff like Zoom and, and Slack, any other tools that you might be using. Uh, good to hear that you're using that to help you stay productive and it's not affected you adversely too much. 
Um, brilliant. So my, my second question is about um, applicant volume. So you mentioned delivery is a fairly seasonal business and, and during this period, you may not necessarily have expected so much um, demand, but I'm curious to understand how applicant volumes have changed for you since the start of lockdown, but also, you know, with re some restaurants opening up again, um, what does that look like uh, in the last three or four weeks? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, we've had um, pretty high demand um, for this time of year. So in terms of like the number of people we've been onboarding, uh, that's been extremely high. Um, and fortunately, uh, well, or maybe not fortunately, depending on how you look at it, at the other end, um, we've seen a, a really high um, volume of applicants as well. Um, and I say potentially not fortunately, this happens, I think, with the on-demand sector, often in a sort of time of, you know, economic crisis or recession is that, you know, people see this as a way that they can get, get a job quickly. Um, but yeah, everything has basically been going up. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, perfect. And then you, you talked about this in your segment uh, briefly, but you know you mentioned it was it was important to standardise recruitment funnels. Uh, could you just talk us about talk through to us about how important that is, um, and what are some of the steps you take to start that process of standardisation? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, it's just it, it really is extremely important. Um, for us to standardize and I think I've talked about it from um, an efficiency perspective already and having those kind of global KPIs so you can monitor and compare markets and also um, in terms of effort put in and a bit of improvement you know being able to work on and test on on one country when you're looking at an improvement and then roll it roll it out um, globally if you're not standardized that becomes a lot more difficult to do um, it also means that if you've got sort of standard processes across your markets, you can actually start to centralize the actual um, internal effort required to kind of manage those pipelines um, and also um, applicant support. Um, and really as well, um, it, you, it just means that you can standardize as much as possible, but also that you're allowing, you also need to make sure that you do allow room for the deviation um, for specific market regulations and requirements. Um, so although we standardize, as I, as I said, it really is important to remain flexible for business need as well. Yeah, absolutely. Especially at this time when things are changing or, you know, very, very quickly. Um, brilliant. So what's next for Deliveroo in terms of recruitment for the rest of the year or 2021? Um, so, I mean, I think really keep doing what we're doing. Um, so, you know, obviously we've got, we've got big targets for the, for the rest of the year and next, um, in terms of what we're doing internally around our recruitment processes. Um, as I mentioned, like some of the, the vendors that we've bought on recently, such as on Fido for document checks and also Edgemi, who we use for our um online learning um so we've started to embed those operations in some of our markets but we need to roll those out globally um and then really just looking for for other ways to streamline and create a seamless applicant experience so there's there's always more more to do yeah absolutely you'll be very busy for the rest of you i'm sure um, <laughs> perfect so just a final question you know personally i'm a massive fan of delivery and feel free to check my account to see how many orders I've put through um, to validate that. But um, I'm curious as from a consumer perspective, just to understand what else is it that you guys are working on? You know, is there any other new features that we should be looking out for um, as people who use your service? Sure. So um, it's COVID has been an interesting time for like the whole business and um, Actually, at the beginning of um, COVID, um, you know, it was a bit of a strange time and a lot of restaurants um, were shutting down, obviously, dine-in, um, which meant that actually that a huge, huge volume of restaurants signed up for, for delivery to do delivery. So there was an increased offering in terms of restaurants on the platform. Um, but what we also found was a sort of bigger opportunity for us. Um, on the grocery side of our business. So we signed up a lot of new um, partners on the grocery side, which is great. Um, and we're also working um, 
with uh, Lloyd's Pharmacy as well. So we're delivering um, medicines to people as well, which is a, definitely a new thing for us. Um, and then, so those are things that have already happened. Something else quite recent, which is an interesting um, new product for us is at the moment, prior to COVID, um, our sort of two product offerings were delivery, but also pickup. So you could um, go to a, you could order on delivery and then go to a restaurant and pick up your food rather than paying for a delivery fee. What we saw um, in Hong Kong actually, where the restaurants were tended to stay open during COVID, um, but they were definitely trying to reduce sort of contact within the restaurants, was some of the restaurants were using our pickup um, sort of product within the restaurant to enable a kind of contact free process in the restaurant. So um, we saw an opportunity there um, and created a new product called Table Service. So that's just launched last week in the UK. Um, and essentially what it allows um, customers to do is um, go to a restaurant and place their order um, for the restaurant within the Deliveroo app. Um, and it support the app also supports other government initiatives like um, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme when that starts. Um, and it's a sort of 0% commission rate. So it's just another thing for delivery to kind of help restaurants um, flourish as much as possible during this strange time. <laughs> um, so yeah, that launched last week in the UK and then it's being rolled out to our other markets in the coming months, which is pretty exciting. Amazing. That is exciting. And also brilliant to see that you can take a learning from one market like Hong Kong and spread it across your other markets so quickly. So yeah, brilliant. Exactly. Um, those were all of my questions, Natasha. I'm not sure if you want to open up the floor to anyone else who's... Yeah, there. absolutely. We've had quite a few questions come through. Um, I'm going to um, yeah, go on screen, so I feel free to, to stay off if it's uh, messing up with your audio. What I am going to do just whilst uh, we are going through these questions, I'm going to launch a little quick poll for feedback on the webinar overall. So just whilst you're still listening um, and we're answering the questions, if you can complete those, that would be amazing. Um, so just some of the questions that we've had come through, actually, there was one from um, your section when you were talking about the, um, the, the job market data. And was that country specific? Was it EMEA? Was it global? Where, where was that data from? Yeah, that data was from the Office of National Statistics. Um, so I've been basically stalking their website over the last few months to see what the trends are. But that's UK wide data. I yep. believe they also just recently released a report about um, the economy and, and where GDP is at, which clearly if you're into some extra bedtime reading would be, um, yeah, I can send the link to that. It's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see how consumer behavior and also unemployment uh, stats are relating to the jobs market in general. Yeah, amazing. And we're good. we have got a few questions, so we're going to try and whiz through them pretty quickly. Um, so the question for you, Sophia, was do you use this system across all roles, including specialists, or is it just for volume? Um, so we use Fountain for all of our rider on boards. Um, so we don't, we don't use it currently for internal like delivery staff. Okay, that great. Sense. Brilliant. And how do you, this is a great question from, uh, from Jordan. So how do you connect with candidates and increase that candidate experience whilst using an automated process? I think it's, it's that fine balance, isn't it? Have you, have you guys got it right or is it still something that you're working on? Definitely something that we're always working on. Like it, I think it's, it's really hard to um, kind of have that like personal touch when you're working at such large scale. Um, but you know things that we really care about is like when we're when we're doing um, you know automated comms are things like tone of voice um, and kind of making sure that the communications we're sending are the right communications for the right time and then you know where you do actually get the chance to have more of a sort of personal touch is when that candidate gets in touch with you um, and you make sure that when they do that you give them the best support possible so you know you've got the sort of um, the sort of proactive automated comms and then the reactive and making sure that the reactive is really great and you answer the question well for them. Yeah, brilliant. It's, um, it's a really fine line and you know what, I, I think with all the webinars and events that we run, we haven't got anyone that's um, got the perfect line for their base. Um, it's always something that's being improved. Um, how do you overcome sourcing restrictions in smaller markets where perhaps the applicant restriction can be a challenge? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's really difficult and our, our marketing team do a really good job at that. And really, um, it's about thinking outside of the box in terms of sort of marketing channels. So not just going through, you know, all of the social media, but like looking at the, the type of profile that you're looking to attract and then thinking about ways that you can reach those people. So we've done things like before, like um, stores in supermarkets in certain cities and that kind of thing and just trying uh, like when you're struggling it's actually having a face-to-face -face presence in 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 that in that place which we found works the best and what about churn how do you deal with churn um at delivery uh well that's that's, that's, one, I assume. <laughs> that's that's a big question um and um, there's lots that we try and do there and, and again it's about different um different crm campaigns that we have and like trying to reach out to the riders at the right time um, um, understanding you know what is it that is causing our riders to churn so we do a lot around you know surveys trying to get insight from from the riders themselves we do a lot of um, uh, rider interviews as well um, to kind of understand why why it is that people are churning but um yeah essentially a, a lot of it is a lot of its comms and then you can also run the odd you know incentivization campaign so do x get y and that can also keep riders interested yeah, brilliant. And do, do you know what your churn is um, compared to others sort of in the market? Is it relatively average? Is it high? Is it low? Do you know? Um, sort of there. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure I could comment, but I think it's probably similar. I imagine it's similar to others in the market. It's like, it, it, you know, it's it's one of those things where you're all, you're 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 providing a similar proposition. Um, and so you assume that across across the board, it's going to be a sort of similar rate of churn. Yeah, and um, we've got one final question um, in, in the flow chart showing the onboarding process, which I think is where we had a little bit of audio issues and um, fire. Um, it started with apply, then went into the onboarding, but there was no assessment process in that chart. So um, they were assuming that this is done separately. So how do you move the candidates from an ATS to Fountain for onboarding or is Fountain also your ATS? So we actually... Um don't provide we don't do run an assessment um sort of process with our candidates so all of our candidates are actually contractors they're not employees um and so um yeah they don't go through a sort of full assessment process they they do you know receive training as part of that animation and then we have a quiz and they have to pass the quiz in order to be able to go on to show that they've got the basic understandings of how to work with us and the health and safety requirements but there's no assessment as such Okay, so it's more of the right to work and all of the sort of legalities um, around it rather than the actual assessment process. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Excellent. We, um, sorry, one final question, might as well just answer, ask it, is how are you measuring time to hire? I think that was originally a question for you, um, Z, but perhaps we can ask both of you on that one. Yeah, um, I'll go first on that. So Fountain allows you to actually track the time to hire from the point at which an applicant starts to process to when a recruiter actually moved them to the approved stage or the hired stage, however you define that. Um, normally for a number of our, for most of our customers that comes after all the doc checks and the actual signature of the contract. Um, as I said before, the process is pretty flexible for you to define, but that's generally how we define that so it would be between approved all the way through to actually them being able to work for you um, okay. and typically that's tracked in number of days mm -hmm. uh, yeah similar so we look at from applied to approved um, and we actually do different metrics so as i mentioned there are points in in our sort of process where we hold the applicants um, and so we look at two metrics one is sort of applied to approved at the whole time so we can kind of measure you know how quickly as soon as there's an action on the applicant side they actually move through the funnel excellent thank you very much um, okay so ladies and gentlemen that is um, that is us done we asked all of the questions i believe um, so hopefully you all got everything answered for you if you do have any further questions that perhaps were a little bit more specific to, um, to what you have um, within your business, do feel free to reach out to both C and uh, Sophia. I think you can get in touch with them. We are sending an email around later, so you'll be able to get in touch with Z 
directly, but for Spire perhaps and some um, LinkedIn might be the best way to ask any specific questions, but do feel free to carry on the conversation afterwards. And um, as I mentioned, we have been recording this session. Apologies for any sort of technical um, issues. Um, we've, uh, yeah, it, the joys of working from home. It's, um, I'm surprised we haven't had more to be honest, but um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, a special thank you to Aspire, Z and also Fountain. Uh, for making this possible so thank you very much to all of you hope to see you soon and uh yeah look forward to the rest of the summer thanks everyone thanks everyone bye-bye thanks so much Bye.